So I'm going to explain the studies researching the effects of weed on five things. Brain structure, psychosis, anxiety and depression, epilepsy and pain. Is this Christmas tree staying here? Yeah, it's Christmas. Get on with it. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Whether you take weed regularly, occasionally or never at all, you may have wondered what causes such interesting effects. Regardless of your position on legalization, weeding through the science and studies is really interesting. So time for a hit of the greatest drug of all time. Knowledge. Let's get into it. Your brain is made up of cells called neurons that constantly send signals to other neurons. The signals are carried by a team of tiny molecules called neurotransmitters that move across this space called a synapse and bind to receptors on the next neuron. Two of these receptors, called CB1 and CB2, are really important for understanding how weed affects your brain. The types of molecules that bind to these receptors, CB1 and CB2, are called cannabinoids. Cannabinoids can refer to endocannabinoids that always exist naturally in your body, like a neurotransmitter called anandamide, and phytocannabinoids that are not naturally in your system but come from the cannabis plant. After taking weed, the phytocannabinoids to start binding to the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Quite uniquely, CB1 and CB2 are found in both neurons, so the phytocannabinoids can bind and cause changes to both neurons. This is called retrograde and non-retrograde signaling. But what changes do they cause? Because cannabinoids can bind to both neurons, they seem to act as a kind of dimmer switch for the second neuron. Cannabinoids generally reduce the quantity of neurotransmitters released from here preventing them from binding here, therefore dimming or reducing the signals sent across the synapse. But it can get quite complicated because cannabinoids can cause the reduction of a neurotransmitter called glutamate. Glutamate causes activation in the next neuron, so less glutamate would mean less activation. But cannabinoids can also reduce the release of another neurotransmitter called GABA. GABA actually causes inhibition in the next neuron, so less GABA means less inhibition, which is also known as more activation. So you can see how this all starts to get quite complicated. Increased or decreased activity to different extents in different parts of the brain. And there are different phytocannabinoids that can have different effects. Two of the most important phytocannabinoids are THC and CBD, or tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabidiol if you want to be a show-off, which obviously I never do. After taking weed, THC and CBD join that team of tiny but mighty neurotransmitters carrying messages across the synapse. THC is the primary phytocannabinoid that causes psychoactive effects and it looks like this. THC binds directly to the CB1 receptor and through this causes many reactions that can alter perception, causing euphoria, changes in stress levels, increased appreciation for food, music and enhanced introspection. CBD looks like this and also acts on CB1 receptors in a slightly different way to THC. Instead of binding directly to the CB1 receptor, CBD binds to another part of the receptor which actually stops the THC from being able to bind so easily. This is called allosteric inhibition. This is really interesting as it shows that THC is really the molecule that drives the psychoactive effects and CBD acts to dampen the effects of the THC. But the frustrating thing is the precise mechanisms are just not fully understood. So there's another tool that we can use, neuroimaging. Neuroimaging gives us something more tangible. How is global brain activity and connectivity changed in the very moment you take weed whilst feeling high? A really recent paper from 2021 helps answer this question. 46 participants were given a capsule containing 7.5 milligrams of THC or 7.5 milligrams of sugar 
the placebo and given an fMRI scan two hours later. fMRI brain scans can tell us which parts of the brain are more or less active. This study revealed that THC causes increased connectivity between a part of your brain called the medial prefrontal cortex and another part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens. Greater connectivity means that these areas were more likely to fire together in people who had taken the THC capsule instead of the sugar capsule, the placebo. This is pretty interesting because your medial prefrontal cortex controls many complex behaviors like problem solving and decision making, and your nucleus accumbens is involved in rewarding pathways. So THC seems to cause this simultaneous increase in rewarding and higher cognitive processes. So kind of like thinking on a higher level than normal and feeling really good about it. Sound familiar? <laughs> and this is cool. After the participants came out of the scanner, they were asked if they thought they had the THC or the placebo. And 77% thought they had had the placebo, i.e. they didn't feel high. Which means about half the people that actually received the THC didn't feel high. This indicates that a large element of feeling high from weed requires you knowing that you've taken weed. A large element is the placebo. Okay, now we can move on to honestly the trickiest part of this video for me to write. Is weed safe to take? And is it potentially even better than safe? Is it beneficial? Hold my chamomile tea. Right, I want to say how frustrating the research for this part of the video was. The research on this is a mess. Different doses, different quantities of CBD and THC, different strains of weed such as sativa and indica varieties, cannabis cigarettes or capsules containing THC, street bought weed being compared to pharmaceutical grade weed. There are all of these crazy misleading news headlines that are written to drive clicks and not to spread accurate information about science. And people feel really strongly about this topic. Some people describe how weed has hugely benefited their life, and other people describe how weed has absolutely destroyed their life, and everything in between. So this is purely academic. It's not advice, it's not suggestions, it's not political. It's just my best attempt to summarize and explain the results and findings of the studies I've read on the safety and the usefulness of weed. All of the papers I discuss are linked below and I encourage you to go read them if you want to. Also, to be blunt, the smoking of anything has a host of very dangerous and damaging side effects that are very well researched and documented in a literature I'm not gonna be discussing here. So I'm going to explain the studies researching the effects of weed on five things. Brain structure, psychosis, anxiety and depression, epilepsy, and pain. Brain structure first. In your brain, you have two kinds of stuff. Gray matter around the outside and white matter on the inside. The gray matter is responsible for information processing and signal generation. The white matter contains the tracts that carry the generated signals to other parts of the brain and body. An interesting study followed 799 teenage participants who had an MRI brain scan five years apart. At the beginning of the five years none of them had ever taken weed. At the end of the five years, some had started smoking weed regularly, some had smoked weed a bit and some had never started. The changes in the brain scans five years apart could then be compared between those who didn't start taking weed and those who did. They found that cannabis use was associated with a reduction a thinning of the grey matter at the front of the brain, and more frequent cannabis use was associated with greater thinning. This association remained even when accounting for differences in total brain volume, handedness, and alcohol intake. This kind of cortical thinning is associated with a number of degenerative brain diseases. It's bad, but it's really important to recognize that this is association and not causation. Proving causation would require a controlled double-blind study across five years keeping everything exactly the same apart from whether people use cannabis or not, which obviously would be both unethical and impossible. The teenagers who chose to smoke weed didn't have structurally different brains at the beginning of the five years, but they may have been on a different brain development trajectory which was associated with whether they chose to start smoking weed or not. One's teenage years are crucial for brain development, and this research is interesting evidence that cannabis use may negatively affect brain development if taken as a teenager, which is when most people start using it. But this study doesn't 
haven't proved that cannabis use as a teenager causes cortical thinning. Okay, now psychosis. So there's a serious mental condition called psychosis. This is where thoughts and emotions are so impaired, there's a break in reality. The main features are hallucinations and delusions. This study looked at 901 participants who presented to hospitals across Europe with psychosis. They looked at these patients' lifestyles and they found that daily cannabis use was associated with an increased risk of psychosis when compared to people who didn't smoke weed. This risk increased more than four times for people who used high-potency cannabis daily. This is quite surprising evidence that smoking cannabis daily, especially high-potency cannabis, increases the risk of psychosis. Not to the point where it's guaranteed or even likely, but it does increase your risk. This finding is supported by this study and this study, which had similar methodologies. The point here is that this finding isn't just one random study. There are numerous studies which support this connection, this correlation and not causation. And what's also very clear is the importance of family history and genetics. For someone who has a family history of serious mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, they have a significantly increased risk of developing psychosis from smoking weed daily in comparison to their peers who don't have the same history of serious mental illness in their family. Now, anxiety and depression. These are together because most research considers them together, which I don't love, but it's what it is. The bulk of this research involves tracking teenagers that do and don't take weed for many, many years and seeing if they develop anxiety or depression. Obviously, there are loads of other factors which will affect this, so this type of study design isn't the gold standard for scientific research, but these studies do have very large sample sizes and other factors like serious mental illness in the family and socioeconomic status can be controlled for to an extent. I'll give you the bottom line, which Andrew Huberman summarizes perfectly in his podcast. Cannabis use is associated with a worse, not better, course of the underlying mood disorder. And the amount of cannabis use corresponds with the outcome, i.e. the more you use, the higher your risk of doing less well. The evidence? This paper collected many studies to create a giant pool of 23,000 individuals. This research found that teenagers smoking weed weekly had a partially increased risk of developing depression and an even more partial risk of developing anxiety. Odds ratios of 1.37 and 1.18 respectively for the statistics nerds. What does this mean? There is some connection between smoking weed weekly as a teenager and increased likelihood of developing depression and or anxiety. Not guaranteed, not even highly likely, but present. No studies that I found concluded that weed, that smoking weed, is completely irrelevant with regards to the development of depression and or anxiety. Anecdotally, many people experience that smoking weed helps their anxiety and depression, and it may actually be helpful for some individuals, but it may also be providing temporary relief whilst promoting long-term harm to an underlying mood disorder. But it's not so clear cut because CBD on its own has actually been associated with reduced anxiety. This study is also really interesting. Researchers gave CBD dissolved in oil or a placebo to people who then had to give a public speech. The CBD lowered anxiety levels more effectively than the placebo, which is an awesome, amazing finding considering how prevalent and destructive anxiety is. I hope this kind of research is continuing to happen. For balance though, taking a CBD tablet occasionally to reduce anxiety is different to smoking weed daily or weekly. I mean, there's no THC in a CBD tablet. So I don't love the jump that's made from studies like this to the claim that smoking weed reduces anxiety. Okay, epilepsy. Okay, so this is really fascinating. A review of four trials involving 550 patients with two types of epilepsy syndromes called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome were given CBD or a placebo. For patients given CBD, four in 10 of them experienced at least a 50% reduction in seizure occurrence 
which is really good. It's not epilepsy cured, it's not seizure free, but it's helpful for some people. Contrast this to the participants who received a placebo in which two out of 10 of them experienced a greater than 50% reduction in seizure occurrence. Such research has actually contributed to the approval of a drug called Epidiolex, which contains highly purified CBD, which is actually given by neurologists to some patients with these two conditions. Some neurologists I spoke to whilst researching this video said that more patients want this drug, but they have unrealistic expectations about how effective it will actually be. Probably driven by these misleading articles online claiming that CBD completely cures seizures. What happens is these people sometimes then go online to order CBD oils. This can sometimes have some effect, but it can be variable. Levels of active ingredients can vary from one supplier to another and even from one batch to the the next. This gives a strong argument for bringing these kinds of things into the mainstream as pharmaceutical products so they can be rigorously quality controlled, ensuring that they're more consistently effective and safer for people to use. Finally, pain. So people definitely experience weed to cause relief to their long-term pain. 2,000 participants with a range of conditions taking medical cannabis took a survey. 90% of them said that it's very helpful in treating the pain associated with their condition. The double-blinded randomized studies, however, don't demonstrate such a clear-cut answer. Some papers show weed to be equally beneficial to conventional pain meds, but like, not better than, and others show no difference between cannabis and placebo in reducing pain. I actually found this quite surprising. I definitely had a worldview that cannabis was really good at treating pain. But this study, 50 people with HIV smoked cannabis cigarettes or placebo cigarettes with the cannabinoids removed three times a day for five days. There was a greater than 30% reduction in subjective pain in 13 people in the cannabis group compared to six people in the placebo group. So kind of helpful helpful, but not more helpful than other pain meds. There's this study. 30 people with multiple sclerosis, which is a neurological disease affecting the brain and spinal cord, smoked either cannabis cigarettes or identical placebo cigarettes with the cannabinoids extracted. And the test group had a partially greater reduction in subjective pain, but again, not like massively. There's this study where 399 patients with advanced cancer with chronic pain not alleviated by normal pain medication, took Sativex spray containing CBD and THC. The results showed that the Sativex spray didn't reduce pain any better than placebo. There's this study where 40 women undergoing elective surgery had their pain meds stopped the day after their operation, after which they were given either THC or a placebo, and there was no difference between them. There are loads and loads of these studies, and none of them seem to conclude that cannabis is this absolutely amazing painkiller that everybody should be taking based on how amazingly effectively it reduces pain. The truth seems to be closer to the fact that it can reduce pain sometimes in some people with some conditions, but not way better than classical pain meds like opioids. But opioids can have huge issues too. They're highly addictive and cause tens of thousands of deaths every year from overdoses. So a potentially equally effective alternative alternative that isn't as addictive would be really amazing. If cannabis is equally effective, though the evidence doesn't seem incredibly strong that it is. Maybe I've missed some amazing paper that contradicts what I've just said. If I have done, then please post it in the comments and I'll, I'll go read them. I'm not infallible, I, I may have missed something. But I did read a lot of papers on this topic and even if a couple of promising studies do exist, they have to stand up against a stack of very neutral evidence. Conclusion? Gah! What is my conclusion? Researching this video, I definitely learnt a ton myself. I guess my conclusion is that age matters a lot, frequency matters a lot, your genetics and your predisposition to psychopathy matters a lot. Cannabis partially increases the risk of mental disorders if taken frequently as a teenager. It's helpful to an extent for epilepsy, or for some epilepsy syndromes, and maybe a little bit for pain. Some people have a huge bias against it, claiming it's much worse than it is. And some people have a huge bias for it, claiming it can cure a whole host of diseases that there just doesn't seem to be evidence for. Many say it's better because it's natural, but I don't think that's a good idea 
argument because there's many natural things that are very poisonous. So all of that is, yeah, that's, that's my conclusion. My hope is that this video has shown you that this story is complex. It's nuanced. If you got to this part of the video, honestly, thank you so much. I'm so happy that I gave you enough reason to stick around. If you did, please put a Christmas tree emoji in the comments as I would love to know who actually made it to this part of the video, if anyone did. Do you have any questions about the brain? Ask it in the comments and I might just spend a hundred hours of my life making a video about it. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll THC you in the next one. Right, we're done.